welcome everybody to our final issue briefing of the, of the day. Now, we've had so many requests for media interviews with the gentleman next to me that, that we've taken a, a practical and pragmatic route. I actually said, well, let's just schedule the media session. So Mr. Monsepi has made him available for, for you know, a certain amount of time to answer questions. I think it's, we'll take it as, 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 as anarchically and free-moving and fluidly as, uh, as, 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 it, as it happens. Mr. Monsepi, do you want to say a few words first to frame this session? Well, uh, I want to thank you for the good work that you and the World Economic Forum are doing and uh, we, we'll uh, jump into questions because I do know that there's a whole lot of other uh, engagements that are taking place uh, year after. So I'll, I'm in your hands. Okay, let's, uh, have it, let's have a show of hands. Who wants to ask the first question? Mr. Busepi's leaving after after the questions run out, so uh, so get your hands on you. Yeah. Okay, Lady Christine at the front, just remind us your name when you get a microphone. Can we have a microphone here, please? Okay, maybe just to save time, why don't you just shout, Christine? I know you've got a strong voice. Um, it's Christine Pellitzer from the Global Press Agency UK. I was wondering if you could just um, briefly tell us in your, your view um, the, you know, the main challenges at the moment in Africa economically, um, but also the brightest spots in terms of economic growth. Well, uh, Africa in many fundamental respects, is no different from uh, many other continents. And, and by that I mean we, we, we have to do the sort of things that create jobs, uplifts people's standards of living, takes us out of poverty, uh, helps provide skills in those sectors of the economies that are growing. And, and the most important thing, I, th I think there's a greater recognition that the, 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 the single most important partner to uh, realize all of the dreams we have for our people is, is partnerships with, uh, with the private sector, uh, partnerships with investors. And uh, we have to stay the cost. If you look at India, I, I've got many friends that I meet with in Davos every year. They run the biggest companies in India. And there's a huge amount of excitement about what Modi is doing in comparison with what they thought were lost opportunities uh, in terms of creating an environment for the private sector in their assessment, because they, they know that economy better than we do. Uh, Brazil under Lula did very well. And there was a bit of a lull afterwards. So there's a lesson in that for us. We, we really have to accelerate the, 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 the regulatory environment, the fiscal and monetary, but more, yeah, more fiscal and governmental in, uh, policies that, uh, that attract investment and make South Africa globally competitive. I don't know whether I've answered your question. Thank you. Bright spots. I think one of the brightest spots is the passion I see amongst young Africans, both entrepreneurs and, uh, and, and I mean, in this country, I see young black and white South Africans, which makes me very, very proud. Who uh, we've got challenges in this country, but these young uh, black and white South Africans who've been to school together and. And I mean, after 25 years, Klaus was talking about 25 years after Mandela went to Davos, young black and white South Africans who don't know what it means to, be, to have different colors and, and, uh, and, and are so excited and passionate about their future and, uh, and their contribution to their growth long term. That, that, that uh, makes me very, very proud. But of course, we've, you know, we've got lots of, lots of work to do in this country in many, in many areas. And, but I'm confident we'll deal with those things. OK, just from the back first, and, and the following on to the gentleman in front of you. Mr. Motsepe, it's Angelo Coppola from China Central Television. Regulatory certainty is one of the key issues that drive economies. And in South Africa at the moment, we're having this bit of an impasse around the Black Economic Empowerment Bill and the mining sector. Your view on what should be done to make 
that bill go through so that everybody can actually get on with business? Yeah. I mean, I, I had a CNN uh, interview earlier, and, and sometimes you, uh, uh, that was one of the key issues that was asked. Uh, l l let me rather answer it in terms of principles. Uh, principle number one is definitely we need regulatory certainty and, and also a regulatory environment that's good for business. There's no doubt about it. Principle number two is uh, if, if you look at what has happened in many African countries, uh, when, the, when colonialism came to an end, there was a new black elite in government. They were the exclusive beneficiaries of economic growth, of development. Uh, their families did very well. The majority of the population uh, either went backwards or, or were not beneficiaries and did not participate in the growth and development. That is a recipe for long-term uh, political and social instability. And I always say, if all of the people in South Africa were green, yellow, forget about any differences in color, but only those whose surnames are Mutsipe grow and benefit from the economy. A recipe for long-term instability. So, so the thinking behind the need to ensure that there's meaningful black participation in the economy, we do need a middle class. This country needs a middle class of black and white people and all of our people the people who've got a stake in the future of this economy. So at the heart of uh, black economic empowerment was supposed to be, because you know most of the uh, uh, transactions we did on the mining side were many, many years before empowerment was established. But for us, it was about a different philosophy. My grandfather was an entrepreneur. My father was an entrepreneur. I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs, and what we knew was, you know, your color is, is irrelevant in terms of your competitiveness and your efficiency and your innovation and the results you deliver to shareholders. So the issue of criteria of performance, of excellence, for us was always important. I would like to see more focus on entrepreneurship, more focus on competitiveness of business overall there will be black business people who will need help. Uh, I, I quickly want to tell you about, we opened a mine in one of the provinces. We currently employ about 5,000 people there. 90% un we opened a platinum mine. 90% unemployment rate amongst the inhabitants where the mine is. Uh, we had to build entrepreneurs from, from, from scratch. Teach them what it means to uh, buy at a certain price, sell at a higher price, be competitive. We had to hold their hands. One of the things that disappoints me about South African entrepreneurship is, and again, you know, I was so amazed in another session I went to, uh, Chatham House rules don't apply, so I can tell you. One of the top Chi Chinese, uh, he works for the government of China, but he, he's basically responsible for China in Africa, and he said, you cannot underestimate the importance of the market. I said, critical, 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 critical. So we personally, when we open, at the heart of entrepreneurship, sorry, of black economic empowerment, was the need to get blacks to become stakeholders in the economy. So. Broad-based economic empowerment has a positive in terms of you've got, to, you've got to bring in new people and as many as possible so that it's, it's not the same faces, even though how excellent they may be. You've got to spread opportunities. But the disadvantage of that is it doesn't allow for capital accumulation. You know, if you look at the Afrikaners in this country, and I don't want this to be about black economic empowerment in South Africa. We'll, if you've got further questions, I'll hang around and deal with it. One of the excellent things Afrikaner business community that in this country is, you know, the great successful Afrikaner entrepreneurs recognize their growth and success and the growth and success of, the, of their families to be inextricably intertwined with the growth and success of the communities they came from. We have to do the same in South Africa. The last thing I want to say, I, I came from the giving pledge this morning. That's partly why I was late. 
And it, you, know, you never stop learning to see how the, the giving place that was started by Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, you never stop learning by seeing how some of the most successful families in the world recognize that they've got a duty in relation to philanthropy and, and uh, you know, create a future for all, uh, try and help those who are less fortunate. The last point, we have no future in this country. Forget about black, white, forget about empowerment. We have no future in South Africa if we don't create opportunities for as many of our people as possible. They've got to have a future and a stake. Otherwise, uh, we will have political instability. But we've got to do the right things. And no corruption <laughs> and, and the sort of uh, you know, jobs for pals or you know, ex benefits because you are politically connected. I mean, you can't build an economy based on that. Gentlemen in the back row, you got the microphone already? A couple of business leaders in South Africa have spoken about um, the various uh, departments that, that have a stake in the economy not working in a more cohesive way. Do you agree with that kind of thinking that, that South African departments focused on the economy could work with a, a more single message to, to, to outside investors as well as to inside investors? I mean, I'll give you a quick answer. You know, I, I had, when I was president of business in the country, and one of the things that, that was important, continues to be important, is to bring black and white business together because, you know, business was divided historically along racial lines. And one of the most inf important things is, you know, when there are things in government that are inefficient, ineffective, you want to change. I, I thought it was primarily South African, but my friends all over the world say it's the same. You, you tend to be so much more effective when you close the doors and if you need to shout and scream at, at them, you do that. But if you go public and consistently point out their weaknesses, you know, you put them on the spot, they start becoming defensive and they feel the need at times to try and uh, protect and explain and justify what they themselves recognize as uh, weaknesses. So I, I've got no doubt, you know, I, 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 historically I never wanted to, you know, we come from an entrepreneurial culture and we focus on our businesses. And I, I, I never used to engage government on the business side. I'm not talking about the policy side because it was what we had to do to get government to recognize that we live in a globally competitive world and South Africa has to be globally competitive to attract investment and do the good things for our people we need to. But uh, you know, on the family philanthropy side and the businesses that we are doing, and, and of course, the tax issues. We, we are trying to get as many women, youth, and black business people to become entrepreneurs and to run businesses. And we see areas in government where they can be more effective. And, and we engage them. I mean, I made a remark on ESCOM in terms, and it was a, a huge issue, but I was expressing a, an opinion which is correct. So overall, there's always room for government to improve. Uh, and there's always areas where we should keep identifying how they can do better. But I, I've, I just found that, you know, when I grab the minister, close the door and tell him, listen, just get, you know, this is, a lot of our business people think we can do better here. Let's get on with it. Uh, I, I find that just, things just get done so much more quickly and so much more uh, effectively, rather than if he reads in the paper, I told him what a lousy job he's doing, you know. Where to start? Okay, gentlemen there, the third row, you had your hand up first, and then we'll go to you, sir, and then we'll get to you. And then we'll move over to this side of the room. Okay, try to keep your questions short and brief. Uh, my name is Christian Butch, Africa correspondent of Die Welt, a German publication. Um, many, or quite a number of very, very successful African business people have gone into politics. Here in South Africa, Tokyo Sexuale, uh, Sir Ramaphosa. Um, I mean, you care a lot about the people, quite obviously, with your foundation, with your personal background. Is there anything that you would consider? Maybe you could make an even bigger change on the political level? <laughs> Let, let, let me tell you, you, know, you, you need, you need uh, uh, people who, I think the, the, we, we, we could make a greater contribution as a family and, and all, with all humility, I think I could most probably make an even more significant contribution by, by keep trying to bring people together and also keep saying the things that are politically inappropriate, incorrect, and because you know, once you take, once you run, once you get into politics, you, you've got to look at a constituency. 
and, and at times get that constituency to keep uh, voting for you. And what South Africa needs is, I mean, the excitement of this country is the future of all our people. I mean, it's, it's you know, we, we've got an incredible wealth of, of talent and of people, and, but we have to focus on the poor. We have to focus on the poor. But if my name is uh, Jan van der Merwe or Sipo Jamini or I've got to believe that this is the best place to live in, in the country. Not because some politicians say that. They don't even care what the politicians say. But because of my experiences and what I see on a day-to-day -day basis. OK, moving on. Gentleman there, gentleman there. Then we'll go to this side. I'm not forgetting you. OK. Uh, Chris Lane at Bloomberg News. Um, I'd be interested to hear your sort of opinion and insight as to um, the opportunity in Ethiopia for businessmen. And um, as a side question, um, South Africa seems to be getting a bit of a kicking in this whole FIFA situation. I was wondering if you had any words of support or defense for your country. Uh, uh, about FIFA? Well, whatever you, whatever you fancy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, I'll tell you, uh, they asked me, this, the, one of my wonderful ladies asked me the question, and I, I learned many, many years ago, I, I used to, I was taught many years ago, don't express an opinion until you know the facts. And, and with the greatest amount of respect, I am so, I've been traveling for the last few weeks, I'm so in the dark on the FIFA issue. But again, uh, and I sort of fumbled my way in trying to uh, express an opinion. And, and I just thought, you know, the critical issue is that, uh, and she was telling me about Mandela, excellent. But the critical issue is that we have to be seen as a, as a country. And, and let me say, I, I have total confidence uh, that uh, and you have to start on the basis that everybody's innocent until proven guilty. So you've got to start on the basis that South Africa should have done all the right things. And, and that's what I have confidence in, and that's what I expect. And, and as a starting point, uh, and then she said to me, of course, the facts show something else. Now, I don't know what the facts are. Uh, but we have to be seen to be a country that adheres to global best practices and at no stage uh, uh, get involved in uh, behavior that can be interpreted as, as improper behavior and conduct. And let me overemphasize, I start on the basis that uh, uh, we will, you know, that we behave in a proper way, that we are innocent until proven guilty. What was your first question? Very briefly, it's Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Now, again, you know, many of the African countries that were not competitive in terms of attracting investment are now exceedingly competitive. So, you know, we don't have a right as South Africa to investment uh, that other countries do not have. I mean, you know, we all have to compete. So Mozambique is doing well. Uh, Botswana has always done well. Ethiopia is an exciting destination. Uh, Ghana has always done very well. Kenya. So, you know, some companies are asking themselves, where should I open my head office? Is it South Africa or is it Kenya? And uh, I know a number of companies, uh, a number of really exciting, great companies that have chosen Kenya above South Africa. So we've got to pull up our socks and uh, the give them a reason to come here rather than elsewhere. Hi, Lee Middleton from Courts Africa. There's been a lot of talk about leapfrogging and that being the answer for, for Africa, for the continent uh, going forward. So I just want to ask you what, what concrete things the private sector should be doing to catalyze innovation and technology and this dream of leapfrogging. And then on that as well, what are the challenges to leapfrogging? I'll, I'll say this, you know, this country has got exceptional business people and CEOs and, and a private sector. And, and I can assure you, the issue of leapfrogging is something that has been looked at across the board. Some of the greatest investors on the continent are South African-based companies. And uh, in technology has an incredible uh, opportunity in terms of Africa not having to go through the processes of developing the technology that many countries, you know, the f five, seven, ten year period of developing those technologies. Mpesa, I mean, I'm, I'm excited. 
uh, I was uh, briefed a few weeks ago that the money that gets transferred to M-Pesa in uh, Kenya, much, much bigger, much more significant than the money that uh, gets exchanged uh, through the banks. Exciting. 700 million cell phones in Africa, double the size of the American population. Exciting. As we speak, uh, there's technology being developed in certain areas. Uh, M-Pesa leads the world in terms of mobile uh, uh, you know, uh, money transfers. Um, my name is Sami Silampa. I'm a correspondent for Finnish newspaper Helsingin Sanomat. Um, the mining industry in South Africa has, over the course of the history, created enormous wealth, but um, to a relatively small number of people. And now at this forum today, there's been a lot of talk about the inclusiveness of, of a growth. So um, what should and could be done in mining industry to make uh, it benefits a larger number of people in this country. Mm. Very good question. Let, let me give you a, an example. I, I grew up in uh, in a place outside Pretoria, and uh, my family had a grocery store and a bottle store and a and a beer hall because at the time. And, and to your question of inclusive growth, I mean, I saw my parents pay for the school fees of children in the village and do various other things that. Uh, uh, reflected their recognition that they had no future if the people in that community didn't succeed or grow. I mean, it's, you know, these things happen subconsciously. You know, those of us who are in the mining industry, uh, both in terms of what we do, but also in terms of the experiences of our workforce. I mean, it's, you know, I can say one thing, but uh, I guess it's more important what uh, the workers who work for us experience. And, and you know we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, at some stage, the whole industry needs a fundamental review. I've got no doubt about it. And and part of that fundamental review, and, and a fundamental new dispensation, at the heart of it must be uh, what you're calling inclusive growth and shared growth. But what what I would refer to as. Uh, uh, stakeholder benefits, stakeholder engagement, a deep commitment in realization, in realizing that I've got a duty to all shareholders. I also have a fundamental duty to the shareholders, who are the people who give who gives us the money to go and open these businesses. If my shareholders who sit in London, New York, or wherever, don't think that the mining industry is a good place to invest and will give them competitive returns over an extended period of time. I do not have a mining industry. So I, I can guarantee you there's a huge commitment on, 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 on the companies that I'm associated with. And, uh, and I know that uh, the mining industry as a whole is, is committed to, to, to engaging in a manner that creates a future that is good for all its stakeholders. Lady, uh, second from the back. You've got a microphone behind you? Thank you. I'm Sasha Planting from MoneyWeb. Uh, staying with the mining industry, we, we tend to talk of it as a sunset industry. Can you share some thoughts on how we can turn it back into a sunrise industry, how we can attract uh, investment, how we can encourage exploration? Yeah. Very, very, very important question. Again, we are not the only country that has got a monopoly in relation to the minerals that the world wants. I mean, there are many countries in Africa and there are many countries in other parts of the world, in South America as well as, I mean, we, we've got a, uh, a copper gold mine in Papua New Guinea, world class. Uh, we, we employ many, many people there. And I mean, the, the deposit is, is exceptional. We've got a copper mine in Zambia. There's a challenge uh, in relation to the global price of copper. But I remain optimistic about the future of the mining industry. There are challenges. There are challenges about uh, our engagement with labor, we have to re-engage with labor. I, I admire the way the German system has managed to, to, to really uh, involve labor as a partner in the growth of the businesses. And, and, and that's partly why you know, German industry worldwide is really outstanding. 
and, and, and America and, and uh, the UK is also, I mean, the, the, the good progress has been made there. But uh, the commodities industry is a long-term industry. There'll be times when, right now, things are, are difficult. Uh, you know, we think for us uh, it creates opportunities in terms of acquisitions and partnerships. But you do have to take a long-term view. But at the heart of this new dispensation has to be government, labor, and us have to come together and, uh, and have a relook in terms of how we can reposition, restructure this industry for the benefit of, of all stakeholders. Okay, gentlemen here, and I think maybe try one more question after that, and then we have to close. You know, he comes from a, a, a newspaper in the townships. If I don't answer, they won't yeah, allow me in that. You, yeah. you, <laughs> they won't allow me in that township. You know. Okay. Um, very good evening, Mr. Motsepe. Um, my name is Stuart Lisulo, senior business reporter with the Post newspapers based for, in for the Post. Yes, Zambia. based in Lusaka, Zambia. Uh, my question basically centers on the uh, mineral royalty taxes, uh, which was a hugely, hugely controversial issue uh, in Zambia. They were raised to 20% for open cast mines and uh, uh, reduced back to 9%, which is still considerably higher than the regional average. So the question, to put it very straightforwardly, is can Zambia, as a mining investment destination, still remain competitive amid that high tax rate? Not to mention, of course, um, the hike in uh, low sulfur gas, uh, diesel, and uh, electricity charges as well. It's, it's very, you know, uh, let's I step Zambia and look at Chile, and then I'll come back to Zambia. Uh, the, the, the Chile has done very well. I mean, I, I know uh, the CEOs of some of the largest copper companies in, in Chile, and uh, there are times when the price of copper went up and the industry did well. And uh, sometimes regulators only remember when the price and, and, and the governments uh, keep in mind or remember the time when, when things were good, when the prices were good and when profits were made. And usually th those good years are preceded by years of many, many years of, of difficulty. I, I, I've had engagements with uh, various people in Zambia. I, I, I have no doubt that there's a commitment to try and work out uh, uh, a dispensation in Zambia that's good for the country, good for the citizens, and good for the mining industry. And, and sometimes, you know, we need to walk a path and, and find each other. But I, I'm very optimistic about Zambia. Final question, sir. Microphone coming away. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mzipe, I uh, just want to find out what are your can thoughts you on, on you this? Your name, please, in your okay. paper. Okay, sorry. Mpo from Soweten. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Soweten is where Mandela used to live, so it's completely, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to find out what are, what are your thoughts on the once empowered, um, always empowered principle? Yeah, that's in court right now. And, and, <laughs> and, and at the same time, um, I've never heard your views, you know, on it holes. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, small businesses, uh, small businesses are always complaining. Basically, complained two weeks ago that uh, that their views are not uh, taken into account when coming up with the with the new decision to implement. Yeah, basically with this new decision. So I just want to find out what are your thoughts on that. <laughs> The next question is, is, what are your thoughts on Mamelodi Sundowns? You know? <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you, Mamelodi Sundowns lose us all the time. No, but l l I mean, uh, the first question was, once empowered, always empowered. You know, two issues. Uh, th there are sensitive discussions underway. And, and, and I can tell you, we can spend the whole day. You know, I, as I said, I, sometimes you don't have time to uh, because it is a complex issue. You can't deal with it uh, within two, three minutes. But the, the, the three things that are key is you, when you've got, in terms of the dispensation, the black economic empowerment uh, dispensation, you know, I always would like to see the 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 black shareholders be 
continue to be shareholders after the sunset period. Because at the heart of empowerment has to be to give those who in the past didn't have a stake, give them a stake. Uh, of course, uh, in a manner that's, that's appropriate, that's in the interests of the country and in the interests of all stakeholders. Now, uh, we have created many, many companies and have, in, uh, and have involved, I mean, literally thousands of shareholders. And then you find a woman who comes to you and says, you know, Patrice, uh, I'm a domestic. I used to earn 2,000 rands a month. And uh, you've given me half a million rand. I mean, she says this with tears in her eyes. Well, that's beautiful. That's, that's good. And then you find, uh, and we've got you know, hundreds of those. And then you find uh, a teacher who, I mean, they, they never came to any meetings. Because this is the, the broad base where we've got literally thousands of people. Never came to any meeting. And then five years down the line, tells you, listen, uh, I've been checking my shares. Uh, my share, you know, I've got a 500,000 rands there, or even 800,000, which is wonderful. My child is being kicked out of school, or my house is being repossessed. And I've got this money. I, uh, I, I need the money. So you can't say to that woman or that father, please don't sell your shares because I want you to remain and have a stake in the, in, in the economy. So we knew I mean, many, many years ago when this whole empowerment process was started that there will be incidences where you know, the market, the behavior and conduct of the market in certain fundamental respects may be out of line with what we are trying to do to help our people. So, you know, uh, we, we'll, we'll uh, talk and, and learn and... Uh, but as I said, these women who, hundreds of them who used to earn 2,000 and they've got half a million, I mean, that's, that's part of the broad base. That, that, that's, that's very good. But uh, do you want to answer the question on ETO also? <laughs> yeah. We, we are involved, and I don't want to bedevil the issue because it may have a, a sort of an impact on, you know, sometimes when you express an opinion publicly on a matter, it has an impact on your ability to, uh, I'm not talking about ETOs, I'm talking about other issues. It has an impact on your ability at times to, to persuade parties where you may have different views. Because, you know, the one party says, you clearly said a view that's contrary to what my stance is, and I'm, not, I'm less likely to be persuaded by you. So, safe to say at all times, you know, and that's why I'll, I'll be a disastrous politician. Uh, the one thing my father taught me is that the customer is always right. And, and I would imagine the voters are always right as well in terms of expressing opinions in terms of what they think is good and not so good for themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we, uh, we've now over time, so we must uh, close this session. I'd like to thank Mr. Masebi for joining us. Thank you all. Thanks to our audience watching online.